Okay, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is uh, Dr. John Belkins. We're from Intelligent Concrete again. And we are still in our quarantine over here at the house. And we're doing uh, engineering for your students. Uh, if you're doing e-learning or homeschooling just like we are, we have students who are running through both science, technology, engineering, and math. Uh-oh. Hold on. Okay. We have students that are doing both sci or doing science, technology, engineering, and math, and us as parents need to be those superheroes <coughs> who really help those kids internalize, understand, and then implement that information. So we're going to go ahead and kick it off, and we're working with two or two simply supported beams here. Um, and, and, and just so you can see through this blue piece right over here is our beam and our simply supported. When I say simply supported beam, you have a beam that's supported by a pin and a roller connection. A pin and a roller connection. When we say a pin, that pin can only support a load in the X and the Y direction. We can still have rotation, but if we try to push down on it, it stops, and if we try to pull, it stops. So again, it resists load in the X and Y direction. On the right-hand side of both of these beams, we have a roller, and a roller just sounds like what it is. It only supports... Okay, there we go. Uh, it only supports a load in the Y direction. So if you put an X direction, if you try to roll it, it'll actually roll uh, that load and won't support that load. So classically, when we talk about engineering, this is where we start. You know, once we get past the pins and rollers and the other different cantilever beams, we get on to analyzing a simply supported beam. So what I've done here, I've set up two different simply supported beams. The first one has a point load of 100 pounds halfway through the span of the beam. The second load has, or the second beam for that matter, has a distributed load throughout the entire length of the beam. Now, consequently, what I did is I made both beams the same length, so they're both 10 feet long, both split down the middle at five feet each, and both loads, or both beams, support a load of 100 pounds. Here in the first beam, we have a point load of 100 pounds, and in the second beam, we have a t distributed load of 10 pounds per linear foot over 10 feet, 10 times 10, gives us 100 pounds. Now, when we work with a distributed load, especially a constant distributed load like this, this rectangular load, we're going to have that point load when we do our 10 times 10, that 100 pounds, it's actually going to be concentrated right here at the center. But again, it is a distributed load. By the way, hello both Instagram and, Instagram and Facebook. So we're trying this out today. Um, and hopefully it's working out. Give us a thumbs up if everything's looking pretty kosher out there. But anyway, let's go through the analysis. Now, uh, what I love about doing an analysis on simply supported beam is that as you run through the analysis, the beam tells you the story. Now, we're not going to run through the math today. We'll do that tomorrow or the next day when, when we're hosting the, the actual math portion of this. I just wanted to go through the story portion, looking at both the shear and the moment of the beam. So, in doing so, we have to understand that if we have a beam that has some type of load of it and that load is pushing down, there has to be reactions that equally push up so the beam doesn't fly off the page or the structure doesn't fall into ruins. So when we have a beam that either has a point load and an equal distribution over the entire beam, especially if that point load is in the center, especially with that equal distribution, we will have equal and opposite reactions that balance out that load. So for this point load that's 100 pounds down, straight in the center, that means at our reactions, we're going to have to have a 50-pound load at each side pointing up to support that downward load. And it's the same thing for the distributed load. We have 10 pounds per linear foot. We have 10 feet, so we have a total of 100 pounds. And to stop that beam from flying down, 
our reactions need to have an equal and opposite, so 50 pounds on each side to resist that downward load, all right? So that's the first thing that we wanna start with, excuse me, the next thing that we wanna start with. All right, so now we're looking at our beams. We got our point load, our distributed load. What I've done here is I've drawn two different graphs. I got my shear graphs and I got my moment graphs. And if you don't know what shear is, you imagine taking a pretzel. Now, you could take a pretzel and you can eat a pretzel, you know, pretzel rod, or you can bend a pretzel, or you could take a pretzel and pull it in opposite directions. And when we pull it in opposite directions, that failing motion right where my hands meet, that's called a shear load. Now, if I took that same pretzel rod and I bent it until it breaks, I made it smile until it breaks, that's our moment. Now, the way we measure those things, for our shear load, we measure it in pounds. In our moment, we measure it in foot pounds, all right? So, with our distri or with our point load, this is where the story begins. We start at our reaction, and that's what this chart does. It starts at a zero point, and it goes all the way, so zero feet, and it goes all the way to the middle point, which is at five feet, all the way to the end, which is at 10 feet. It does the same thing on the distributed load chart. So for our shear diagram, we start at our pin, at our zero feet. And as we've already talked about, at that pin, we have to have that equal and opposite load divided by two since we have our two points. So we have 50 pounds that has to push up and that's what we see here in our shear diagram. You see that green line, it pushes up and that represents our 50 pounds is being pushed up or in the positive direction. Now, as we go across this beam for this five feet or 4.99 feet until we get to the center, when you look at that 4.99 feet, there's nothing going on over there. It's absolutely empty. It's constantly nothing. That means if nothing is going on, we have a constant point until, or a constant across until we heat hit our 100 pound point load that is pushing down. And that's exactly what we do. So we start out with our plus 50, we go across five feet, nothing is happening, nothing is happening, until we get to our point load where it drops 100. Now, 100 minus 50 equals, everybody say it with me, 50. So now, <clears throat> because we started with a positive 50, but we're pushing down a negative 100, we end up having a negative 50 pounds in our shear load. But remember, after our point load, there ain't nothing going on. It's constant, it's constant, it's constant, until we get to our roller where again we have that 50 pounds going in the positive direction which is great because right now we're in the negative that 100 pound point load pushed us down into the negative area of our chart but as we get to the end of our beam where our roller is we have our positive 50 that pushes us back up and balances out the beam how beautiful is that and that is what we call a statically determinate beam. We determined everything about it and everything was balanced and beautiful and that's for our shear load. Now, to get to our moment diagram, again, there's a story to be told. And it's all told for the moment diagram from the previous diagram in our shear diagram. So if we look at our shear, our first part of it, we have a constant positive area in our first half of our beam. Now the great thing about the shear diagram is that the data set that we get for the shear diagram is the gradient that we have for our moment diagram. So with our shear diagram for the first five feet we have a positive constant value. Now with our moment diagram we're going to take that and you have a positive increasing, or excuse me, a positive, not increasing, a positive constant gradient for the first portion of our beam. 
Now, when we hit that midpoint, everything changes. Instead of it being a positive constant, it's a positive, or excuse me, positive. Well, I really need to get some sleep. It's a negative constant slope, meaning it takes us back down to zero. Now, unlike the shear load, our moment load is zero at both ends. Remember when we did our shear, we had a positive 50, we had a positive 50, and that helped us bring down to, to zero. But with our moment, we're gonna start zero, zero, because remember, we're dealing with a pin and a roller, and both of those can support a moment. They can only support an X and Y direction load and a Y direction load, so of course, since they can't resist a moment, we're gonna have a zero value at both of those, and boom, Bob's your uncle, it works out absolutely beautifully. Now, moving on to the distributed load, it's almost as if we can see the story. Remember, every beam has a story. So with our distributed load, if we look down the beam, we start out with this constant load and this constant concept here. And what we're going to find is that we have this constant positive going across the pause do okay we're back on instagram sorry we keep getting these pauses but we have this constantly increasing or excuse me this constant positive slope when it comes to our shear diagram and every linear foot has to bring back that value from or excuse me brings up our value and then when we get to the other side of our beam it brings that value back down to our zero. Now, here's the fun part. When we get to our moment diagram, again, remember the same holds true that we have that same story, where in our um, point load, we had that constant going all the way across. We had that constant going. Now we have an increasing slope as we go towards the center, we reach our maximum at the center, which makes sense. Is that a child? I think that's a child. Sorry, we have three children who have yet to go to sleep. So, thanks, babe. So, the same holds true that to get the shape of our moment diagram, we have to look at our shear diagram and use the value from our shear diagram as the slope for our moment diagram. So when we look at this, oof, did I just make a mistake? I feel like I just made a mistake. Time out everybody, let's take a look at this. Let me get some markers here. Where's my markers? I think that's the first one. Oh, here are my markers. Let me get my green and my red. So with that, that should be, uh-oh, I think I made a mistake in this. That's okay, folks. See, that's the whole, that's the best part about this. Okay, so I did make a mistake here in drawing this out, all right? So again, we have our positive 50. I'm going to redraw this. Let me redraw it in green. Ah, sorry. Okay. So again, we have our positive 50 that we get from our reaction. So there's our positive 50. Oops, oops. There's our positive 50. And then what happens is every time we go a linear foot, we lose 10 or we're pushing down 10 pounds. So instead of it being like I drew before, it wasn't a triangle. It's actually something that looks like this. And it comes back up. Oh, that's beautiful. Look at that. Isn't that gorgeous? And that works out. I apologize profusely, but hey, this is engineering. We have to learn from our mistakes. Oh, this is so exciting. Okay, so let me retell the story. So we started at our pin location, just like before. We have that positive 50 going up, which is splitting that 100 pound or that 10 pounds per linear foot over 10 feet. So we have our starting 50 pounds, and then every linear foot after that, we're pushing down 10 feet until we get to our middle point. Now, this is where we hit zero. Now, as we pass that zero point, we're still 
10 pounds per linear foot pushing down. So every time we go down five or one foot, it's 10 pounds down. So if we go one foot over, that's 10 pounds, two foot over, that's 20 pounds, all the way out to five feet, that's negative 50 pounds. But it's a good thing we got our reactionary load or our reaction to push us back up 50 pounds to get us to zero. Oh, isn't that exciting? I made a mistake. Oh, yeah. All that work on that flipping chart and this chart, <coughs> I made a mistake, but shoot, we recovered like a champ. Oh, great. Well, I had that triangular, oh, shit. and it's not the triangular. No, it's the... Right, 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 right. Okay, so this works out beautifully. So now we go back to our moment diagram. Now, remember I said the instantaneous value on our shear diagram happens to be the value or the slope on our moment diagram. So I know I just said a lot of big words for a lot of folks out there, but what I'm trying to say is here we have a maximum value. That's a high value. Here we have a zero. Here we have a very high negative value. Now, if you look at the slope here, oh, I got a red marker. If you look at the slope here, it's very high. It's a very steep slope. If you look at the slope here, it's zero. And if you look at the slope here, it's very, very high, negative high. So what we've got here is our slope starts high and positive, giving us this uh, uh, positively decreasing slope. Because as we go to the center, we're going to our plateau or going to our zero slope. So we have a positive slope but it's a positively decreasing slope until we get to the middle point where we have a negative increasing slope until we get to the end of our beam where we see we have this maximum. But again, because we're both, or we're dealing with both of these beams, they have pins and rollers, we're going to have uh, zero moments at the end because pins and rollers can't support moments. Things that support moments are like cantilevered uh, connections or, or ends to them, and that will actually have a moment to it. So yeah, these are our simply supported beam where we did a point load and a distributed load. We did our shear and moment diagram. I apologize for screwing up that shear diagram, but hey, such as engineering, we've got to learn from our mistakes, and that's how we learn. Um, and yeah, that's our distributed load with our shear and moment diagram. So what we're going to do next time that we meet is we're actually going to do the math behind these. We'll take one at a time, we'll review the math, and we'll look at how these all balance out. So not only do they not fly off the page that a lot of professors used to tell me, but also so that the equations are balanced, the structure is balanced, and it definitely doesn't fall apart when we put this all into practice. So thanks for joining us today. Wait, did I forget anything? Thank you for Y'all are awesome. Stay strong out there. Stay healthy. Um, go concrete. Beat asphalt.